Welcome to the Mava Farewell Celebration. You're joining us and honoring a family that quite literally rolled up their sleeves to make this world a little better. And I'm not just talking about the Hoffman family. I'm also referring to Mava's partners, the whole team and board that made Mava Foundation their home and purpose for years. The Mava Foundation inspired, led, and funded challenging strategies that moved the needle on critical environmental issues. The foundation operated for nearly three decades. It is now officially saying goodbye, but not without leaving an impactful and memorable legacy. Let's take a look at how it all started. Our story is one about 28 years of people coming together to save natural heritage, rebuild ecosystems, transform lives, and create a sustainable legacy. In 1948, Dr. Luke Hoffman decided to buy an old farm at the Tour du Valais in the Camargue. He made a home there for his family and dedicated himself to studying this complex ecosystem. Inviting scientists from all over the world, it became a renowned international research station for Mediterranean wetlands. It was here that Luke learned the power of bringing people together as he needed to rally the support of local people to ensure the protection of greater flamingos which were endangered. Luke was one of the first to recognize wetlands as important ecosystems. He was a pioneer of the conservation movement, helping to co-found some of the leading global conservation organizations. He dedicated time, energy and funding to five iconic sites that would ultimately become a core part of Marva's work. In 1994, Luke founded Marva, named after his children, to provide philanthropic and technical support for the projects that he was devoted to. From 2005, Luke started to recruit a team to work with him. This was the birth of our secretariat and a step towards professionalization. We launched a strategy with a region-based approach focusing on the Mediterranean Basin, coastal West Africa and the Alpine Arc. 2010 was a major turning point when Luke's son André took over our growing foundation, encoding his father's values of being flexible, unifying, empowering and persevering. André's vision was to contribute to the creation of a more sustainable global economic system by directly mitigating the root causes driving biodiversity loss. This led us to develop our Sustainable Economy Programme, in 2015, Marva merged with FIBA, providing increased capacity and expertise to the Foundation and our partners. In 2016, the Hoffman family and our board confirmed Luke's plan to close Marva in 2022. A final strategy was developed to achieve ambitious objectives through strong coalitions of partners working together towards 23 specific outcomes and preparing our partners to flourish after our closing. We reinforced our efforts to ensure the long-term sustainability of the work and partners we have supported over the years. Support went beyond projects, taking an holistic and varied approach to philanthropy. Through the generosity of the Hoffman family, we allocated a total of 1.17 billion Swiss francs for approximately 1,500 projects implemented by more than 500 partners. We are proud that our partners have told us this support has lit a beacon of hope for vulnerable species and ecosystems, catalyzed ideas from promise to progress, united the conservation community, planted seeds of knowledge and empowered people to protect nature. Partnerships continue to work together on new plans with new supporters heading into the future. Thank you to our partners, fellow funders and many other friends for 28 years of collaboration to help people and nature. Over 1 billion Swiss francs allocated for approximately 1,500 projects. The founder, Luke Hoffman, would have turned 100 years old this year. Today, Mava released a commemorative book with the full story, including anecdotes, expressions of gratitude, and photographs shared by partners. You can access it on Mava's website starting today. In this very short event, 
we will be showcasing a small sneak peek of this massive journey, starting with the man who reshaped the whole foundation, André Hoffman, son of Mava's founding father. Welcome, André. How are you? Well, I'm very well, Ayan. Thank you for having me here today. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. Now, to begin with this event, can you build on your father's, uh, I mean, can you, you built on your father's approach, excuse me, when you came into this foundation by adding a focus on sustainable economy. Can we talk a little bit about why that was so, so important to you? Yes, I think that's a very important question and I'm very glad that I have an opportunity to answer it. I think uh, it also had to do with our background. My father was a trained zoologist. Uh, he, he did studies on uh, the environment and understood the working of ecosystems of species and of spaces really well. I have an economist background and I thought it would be a, a contribution to the problematic to also include some, um, so, some thinking about how we actually, yeah, how we value nature, how we value the environment. And in particular, um, I was trying to address the root cause of uh, humans' predation on natural system because we, you know, we've, we've been trying to protect nature and to conserve it for a long time, but we can see that the pressure of humanity on the planet are increasing. So we needed a new approach, and I thought, uh, and I thought that looking at the, at the economic root causes of degradation of the environment was probably a good way forward. Very clever indeed. Now, something that's very intriguing is the way you and your sisters were brought up. Even though you come from a multi-billion dollar in wealth family. You grew up in a remote farmhouse in Camargue, France. Um, but above all, you grew up very connected to nature. So how did that experience shape you and your sisters? Well, <clears throat> uh, first I have to sort of make a little reality check. You know, we, we are in the Camargue. The Camargue is part of the Rouge du Rhône. It's France. It's okay, it's France of uh, 50 years ago, but it's France. And so it's not completely wilderness. But we are close to nature. We are close to an environment which at the time was, was much more diverse than it is now. And we are, we are close to uh, a lot of things which uh, have uh, introduced, opened up our eyes to what, to what um, nature actually is. The house was always full of scientists, visiting scientists, coming to talk uh, about, uh, coming to study nature. And I think that's play, played a role. My father started the research institute just next door to our home. But it also is the fact that, yeah, you wake up with the mosquitoes, you, you wake up with the, with the ducks, you wake up with all sorts of noises and things. And so, yes, until the age of 14, 15, 16, according to, to the age of the siblings, we actually lived in this environment. And it certainly did connect us to nature. And since we mentioned Camargue, we have actually received a message from one key partner of MAVA ever since your father's leadership. And we're talking about Jean Jalbert, mm -hmm. the uh, current director general at La Tour du Vala. Let's take a listen. Je suis arrivé ici à La Tour du Vala en 1994, c'est-à-dire l'année de la création de la Fondation MAVA. I arrived here at La Tour du Vala in 1994, the year the MAVA Foundation was created. So I had the opportunity to work with Luc during all these years. Beyond uh, his vision, his determination, what struck me was his unwavering faith in mankind. Until the end, his powerful and humanist project, and also his fierce determination to reconcile people and nature. He also had this sense of wonder, so he came here to come out to make a childhood dream come true. He settled here, lived here, studied birds. And I remember that when he was 90 years old, we brought him to these marches to watch pratingles, migratory birds he loved. And they came back during the spring. So as he was watching these pratingles glide in the air, um, his glance was still filled with wonder like a child's. That was very moving and a great lesson too. What did you like about this collaboration with Mava? I had the privilege of being both an actor in the development of La Tour du Vala and an attentive witness of the evolution of the Mava Foundation. During all this time, during these decades, La Tour du Vala benefited a lot from the support of MAVA, from a very easy, caring dialogue which was impact and outcome oriented, but did not focus on method. This support was always as flexible as possible, with the least red tape possible. In short, MAVA was the ideal partner for us, and for us, all 
beneficiaries, I think. Thanks to MAVA today, our organization is a stable, healthy, recognized influence. Thank you, Georges Albert, for such an invigorating message. Indeed, as we move on with this program, we'll see how connected MAVA grew all the way from West Africa to the Mediterranean to Switzerland. Now, talking about your father, we are all curious. Was there any resistance from him while alive when he was seeing all of these changes that you were making in the organization that he founded? Yeah, yes, of course. I mean, my father was not neither deaf nor, nor incapable of thinking. So, so he was actually looking around and, and seeing the world as the world is. I think Jean captured it very well when he said that, you know, he had this constant look at nature and try to understand what was that could be done. So uh, when I came with a different approach, he listened, he um, uh, thought about it. Uh, I, I wouldn't lie by saying that he was enthusiastic. I mean, for, for him, this notion of preserving nature, conserving nature, nature conservation is not the same thing as making nature as a partner of humanity, which are two things different. But he loved people. He loved listening to people's opinion. And after having taken a bit of uh, convicting, convincing, pardon, he, um, he supported me in an absolutely exemplary way. I mean, at no moment did he talk into the way I was allowed to, to, to chair the foundation. And I think that was, uh, that's, a, that's an incredible strength of character, which I hope I will be able to have with my children when the time comes. And now, uh, MAVA's team members have frequently mentioned the way the foundation has persevered. Any particular aspect that you feel most proud of? Yes, so I think that's very much in keeping with what we were just saying about the work of my father in the long term. Uh, so there are certain uh, partners, there are certain projects, certain uh, places that you need to support in the long term. We've been talking about the five iconic sites, and we found a solution for that, which I'm sure we'll come back to later. But we also had to, de to deal with some partners' organization. And again, in the short film we just saw, we saw that my father was active into five big organizations and has helped them to develop into what is really today our reference system for nature conservation. Um, I'm thinking in particular of WWF, uh, the, World Wide Fund for, uh, the World Wildlife Fund that it was known, now known as the World Wide Fund for Nature, where my father and later on myself, I was vice chair of the, of the organization for 20 years, um, uh, you know, how we eventually ended up uh, executing our mission of nature conservation more e efficiently because we had the long-standing support of MAVA. And I think that, that um, of MAVA and uh, indeed of the family. And, and I think that really um, is a, a legacy which I think we can be proud of. Now you mentioned WWF. We actually have a message from Marco, uh, Marco Lambertini, who worked as the CEO of WWF during the last years of MAVA. Let's take a listen. MAVA has been the most steadfast partner of WWF International from the beginning. It has supported projects in many countries of MAVA's priority regions, like in the Mediterranean, but also global initiatives, like the recent New Deal for Nature and People campaign that contributed to an incredible success of the Biodiversity COP15. MAVA has focused on financial contribution, but also on building capacity and stable presences like for WWF in North Africa. I would characterize MAVA support as focused on impacts, long-term and persistent. And in fact, MAVA stood by WWF also in difficult times when local or global social political instability has affected and slowed down our progress, our projects. MAVA has contributed to many organizations, including WWF, to achieve long-term and lasting conservation impact. We're going to miss you, but you made us stronger and more resilient. And we thank you for that. Onwards. Now, André, um, your family and uh, the rest of the MAVA team became game changers for nature conservation. But the w big question here is, has MAVA changed you in any way? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I hadn't seen the clip we just saw from, from Marco, and the fact that he shoots that in nature is a real sort of, that, that's exactly what, what the sort of legacy we want to leave. So that's just fantastic. Thank you, Marco. Yes, of course, it's changed me. I mean, when you meet people like Marco, when you meet people like all the team of MAVA, when you meet the, the 500 partners we mentioned before, I mean, these are all extraordinary people living extraordinary lives in extraordinary circumstances. So the idea of saying I've been the chair for 15 years and I'm exactly the same would be incredibly arrogant. 
And, and I, you know, I, I've learned a lot along the way from all these people we worked with. Yes, we were able to provide support in the long term. And yes, we were able to be persevering, unifying, empowering, all the values we've just, we, we just looked at and flexible. But it, for, for me, um, uh, it's part of my life over the past 15 years, and it has made me the person I am today. So singling out one of the experience would probably be rather difficult. And today you have become a reputable businessman who has been able to combine both interests, uh, business and nature. And we will certainly hear more about that later in the show. We want to hear more. Thank you. Um, I want to hear also your advice for future sustainable endeavors and, of course, your next life chapter. So do stay stu tuned until the end because we will be coming back with André. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Of course, André could not lead alone. Linda Manson stepped in as CEO to serve as André's right hand. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I am thrilled to hear all about the behind the scenes. But first, I want to look at the big picture. What was the overall impact of MAVA across all of these years? It's a great question, and I believe we've had a lot of impact. It is really a challenge to try to synthesize 30 years of action and the, the full breadth of work that we've done in a few short, short statements, but I'm going to try. So we feel we did five big things. Protecting species and ecosystems, um, supporting new ideas and small organizations, building a conservation community, enabling knowledge generation, and empowering individuals and organizations to protect nature. So within those five things, um, I thought it would be useful to drill down a little bit and give you some examples. So let's zoom into that first one on species and ecosystems. And I'm gonna talk about one region, one partnership in one period of time. So you can imagine it goes really far beyond this. But within the Mediterranean, we had a coalition of partners working on wetlands. And although we, we supported a number of different ecosystems, we're most known for our work in wetlands. So that's why I wanna give the example here. And this partnership was able to restore 30,000 hectares of wetlands over 25 different sites. They increased the protection status of 10,000 hectares additional to that. And we now have a complete inventory of island wetlands throughout the Mediterranean. Um, you've heard Andre talk as well about the iconic sites. It came up in the video. All five of those iconic sites are also wetlands. Um, where we did a lot of work and we managed to put in place for each one of those sites some form of a conservation trust fund so that they have some kind of evergreen funding to carry forward into the future. We have just produced our foundation uh, final review, which goes into these five areas in a lot more detail and gives more context and a lot more examples. So I encourage people to discover that on our site where it will be published within about two weeks. All right, looking forward to see that review. And you certainly mentioned big numbers in there, so looking forward, thank you. Now, you arrived at MAVA just when Entre was seeking to restructure strategies. Um, in the book, you were quoted that it was like being in a startup, like having a blank canvas, but already with all the funds and a reputation. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience and reshaping the whole strategies. Yeah, it was a very fun time. So when I came in, Andre had just taken over as president and my mandate was to professionalize the foundation. And we had the benefit of having a fantastic, knowledgeable team in place, a secured funding stream and a great reputation. So we had those super building blocks already in place, but everything else was there to be shaped. And so we sharpened all of our strategies. We changed the, the criteria we use and the way we went about allocating our funds. We changed the roles of the team members significantly. And really importantly, we, we really increased our level of transparency and started communicating a lot more about all of those things I just mentioned so that our partners knew how best to engage with us. So 
some important blocks were in place, but there was a lot of creation to happen. It was kind of the best of both worlds, and it was really, really fun. And so I tell people now it was true then, and it's true all the way through to the end that I really had the best job in the world. And you know, all the team members knew about Mava's limited lifespan for years. You knew from day one. Was the looming closure a pressing factor to set as many milestones as possible, especially ensuring that continuity of projects, even without Mava's funding? Yes, definitely. So we, we all knew about the closure well, well, well in advance. I knew from the moment that I was hired that our grant making would end in 2022. That at the time seemed so far away, just way out on the distant horizon. But of course, time passed quickly. And it was really in 2015 that we got very serious about planning for our closure. And we began communicating more about it with our partners. And at the time, I had a really clear objective. We called it, we, we want to have an, an elegant exit, which to me meant that all of our stakeholders, whether staff members of MAVA or our partners, knew what to expect and knew what was coming down the pipeline. And I think we did pretty well on that. So we also really became obsessed about continuity. And we created a whole new program of work to help build the capacity of and ensure the sustainability of our partners and the work that we've been supporting. And that uh, entailed things like organizational development, capacity building, leadership development, a small grants program, and sustainable finance mechanisms. And the big lesson from all of that is that investing in capacity and sustainability of the partners really pays off. It makes a huge difference for them. Whether you're closing or not, this is an investment worth doing. And I think the, the proof of that is out of the huge number of partners that we have funded, to my knowledge, all of them but one are able to continue forward into the future, which we count as a huge success and shows that those sorts of investments really pay off. Wow, so out of the, the 500 partners, only one and there's a story around that one, but to my knowledge, there's only one. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you for that information. Uh, now, MAVA has four core values. We have a unifying, persevering, empowering, and flexible. And you were just talking about your partners, and your partners had been mentioning that flexible and empowering were the two that were, well, two of the most important ones when it came to funding. So can we elaborate a little more on that? Yeah. Sure, let me say a word about our values. Um, <laughs> when Andre and I came in, it was sort of a new era for MAVA, but we really wanted to maintain the heart and soul and spirit that we had previously. So we defined these four values that were meant to encapsulate sort of the lukeness of what we had before so that we kept that spirit as we went forward. And these are values we defined and really took very seriously. We didn't put them away in a drawer. If you ask any MAVA staff member, they'll be able to tell you what those values are and what it looks like for them on a daily basis. So for the two that you mentioned, let me give a couple of examples. Um, for flexible, I was at an event recently where I got to meet a lot of our partners and there was a common theme in what they had to say um, about us and the work we did together, which was expressing thanks and appreciation for MAVA's early flexible investment in their ideas or their organizations, which gave them the time to test and iterate and prove the concept, which led to being able to scale up the work and attract more funding and therefore lead to a lot of successes. And those successes can be traced back to the, the early flexibility they had to get it right. So that's something that we're, we're very proud to have contributed to. In terms of empowering, um, this is an example that's close to my heart because I'm a big believer in leadership development. As we were planning for our closure, one of our strategies was to help develop the capacities of leaders that are needed to carry the conservation movement forward into the future when we're not here anymore. So we created the MAVA Leaders for Nature Academy, 
which was a, an intergenerational program that turned out to be very interesting. About 200 of our partners were able to participate in this program. And the feedback from them has been amazingly positive. And we really consider it to be one of our, one of our proudest accomplishments. Well, you are talking about that specific accomplishment, the MABA Leaders for Nature Academy. We have a video about that. Let's take a look. I would say before the Academy, I did feel uh, illegitimate in my role. And the Academy helped me to, to, to grasp this leg legitimacy because nobody is going to give it to you. Everyone who participated in the Academy from our team um, kind of shared similar thoughts that it's been not only transformative but also kind of we upgraded ourselves. We learned lots of new skills. Professionally, I would say it helped me in understanding what leader is, who leader is and what leadership is actually. Uh, we were doing a lot of stuff uh, as we learned it at the university. Now we are approaching leadership in a different way. And that helped me to do better performance internally in the organization, as well as in the relationships that we do with the stakeholders and partners. Linda, last question for you today. How will MAVA's legacy be carried forward? So let me refer back to our values. One of our values is unifying. And we are really big believers in the power of working together. And we have worked a lot with other funders, uh, with our partners. We've catalyzed collaboration amongst our partners. And in our final phase, we intentionally set out to create coalitions of partners working around a joint strategy that they defined together. Um, we created 23 of these partnerships, and I'm very happy to say that almost all of those groups of partners have decided to continue working together on the same kinds of things they worked on before. This is an essential component to carrying forward Mava's legacy. And I'm very touched by the number of partners who have said, you know, don't worry, we're going to carry on what you started, which is fantastic. And this is enabled by a, a great number of other donors who have stepped in to support some of the work that we've been supporting over the years. And initially, we were a little bit worried, I guess, about whether it would be interesting for other donors to pick up where we left off. But on the contrary, there's been a lot of interest and, in fact, very proactive interest. I get phone calls. You fund good things. We need good things. Is there anything that you can send our way? And of course, the answer is always yes. And when I thought about it, I realized that in a way, we de-risked those investment for other donors. So these partnerships now have results. They can show that their partnerships work well together. And that means other funders can step in with a high degree of confidence in what they're able to do. And I'm just so very grateful to all of our fellow donors for stepping in to help carry forward Bamba's legacy. Linda, this has been so inspirational. Thank you for your passionate work from the day you first set foot on, at MAVA until the last day of its operations. Thank you. Thank you. Let's dive deeper into some of the success stories that you'll see in MAVA's book. The first one in West Africa and its coast, most specifically in Guinea-Bissau home to one of the largest green turtle populations in the world. This is where Mava's turtle conservation began in the year 2000. It was not only a matter of protecting turtles on site, but also protecting them from poaching as they migrated to other islands. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for having us. Now, Charlotte, let's start with you since you are part of the Mava team members. Can we talk about the turtle conservation progress that MAVA had in the coastal West Africa? 
Yeah, thank you. You know, the story of the sea turtle conservation uh, begins indeed um, in this tiny sacred island of Poilau, in the Bijagos Islands. Uh, this is one of the top actually nesting sites for green turtle. And uh, there is a very strong culture there that helps conserve not only the ecosystems, but also the species. After that, uh, we set up to set on to support sea turtle conservation also in Cape Verde. Cape Verde Islands, particularly Boa Vista Islands and Mayo too. Boa Vista is, so, is also one of the most important um, actually sites for loggerhead sea turtle, which is another species. But you know, we are talking about species that are migratory. They don't stay at an, uh, one place. They move between the islands. They move from country to country. So in our work, research was really key. And the research con, uh, could support, identify those places that are important. That's how we also knew that uh, the Bandaga National Park in Mauritania is so important as a feeding place for green turtle. So today we have seven countries working together to try to protect these species along the coast, but all over the ecoregion, which is a tremendous difference, you know, with the past where people would be working uh, alone on their own on the sites. And now, Euclides, you are from Cape Verde. You have an organization there. You are representing it. it uh, and uh, you were talking to me before about how you were able to seize that opportunity of working with MAVA. So how did you seize that opportunity? I think, first of all, thank you for having me here today. It's a true honor to be present to celebrate with MAVA um, this farewell. Um, I believe we seized every opportunity available to partner with MAVA. For instance, um, by thinking out the hat and um, working with new technologies into turtle conservation, such as dogs and drones. Today, those methods, especially with drones, it's being implemented in almost all the islands of Cape Verde. Also, we see different opportunities for MAVA, such as the Academy, as Linda mentioned, and also organizational development. This program really helped us as an organization reinforce our capacities. Also, into fundraising. This was a very important um, opportunity we needed to seize. And today we have an international fundraising team, Total Foundation from the Santa Taruga and our partners in Indonesia, um, where we share information with one another and support each other into fundraising opportunities. I think by seizing these opportunities, um, really secured, was the key to secure the future of our organization. And in Mava's book, uh, we also see how empowering local organizations was so important to mitigate the root causes of uh, the problem, which was turtle poaching, right? Yeah. So can you elaborate more on what that empowerment meant? I think the empowerment you need to get the communities involved. By hiring local people to work in total conservation is very beneficial. Um, a poacher can poach once or twice, but it is not sustainable. By actually working in total conservation and participating in total conservation, this is more sustainable. Also, developing and creating um, opportunities for the local people to generate some type of income. So they can generate some income and they don't have to resort into total poaching as a source of income. Also developing community activities. For an example, in 2021, Funda Santa Taruga um, developed a swim course program which the children of the island from ages 5 to 14 can learn how to swim. I think this is very important because the children can love, can create love for the ocean and the ocean species, not just for turtles, but different species of the ocean. I would like to say that MAVA helped the organizations 
and we help the people. And you're talking about the people there and yeah. the people are, are so important because if we don't empower the local populations, we can't really see a huge difference. Exactly. And that is when, where uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Aisa Regala, um, she is a coordinator of EBAP Biodiversity Monitoring and Conservation Department. Uh, that's where she comes into play uh, in, the, in empowering local communities. And she comes from Guinea-Bissau, she's based there, and she sends us the following message. It is important to involve communities, as they are the first to come in contact with their resources. This participatory approach, which integrates youth and the local community in monitoring and even research activities, allows us to reduce conflicts with the communities, as they know why we do this work, and are also better acquainted with the con conservation rationale, and also to enhance sensitization. Indeed, we believe that when one person is sensitized, the whole family and community is also affected positively. We enhance these young people's capacities in specific areas. Some have specialized in turtles, others in fish, in birds, etc. They can raise their incomes, for example, by engaging in conservation work, alternative economic activities such as ecotourism, and thus benefit from a better quality of life. And they can also protect sea turtles in their nesting and feeding habitat. Thanks to MAVA funding, which recognizes the role of communities in resources management, every year about 55 Bijago youth take part in monitoring and research activities around sea turtles. More than 31 locals work full-time at IBAP, as rangers, sailors, or else activities leaders. Some of them, who used to be hunters of some emblematic species, now retrained and are now sailors. They, they are also represented in the management structure of the protected areas. One of the challenges we still face today is the representation of women in monitoring and conservation. In short, I think the participatory approach to conservation has contributed a lot to the growth of green turtle populations in Guinea-Bissau, more specifically on the island of Poilo, the largest colony of this species in Africa. Resources are shared and it is crucial to involve everyone and uh, to make sure that biodiversity is embraced everywhere. Thank you. So what happens to these turtles after the closure of MAVA? How will the legacy be carried forward? Can we start with you, Charlotte? Yeah, thank you. The legacy is really, you know, there. We have people who have understood that they have to work together. They are working together because otherwise it's difficult. We have people with capacity, local people with academic and technical capacity. We have also people who are doing science and science is really actually guiding the decision making. And we also have people who are working with the local communities, you know, to make sure that those who are actually the guardians of the, the sites are also in charge of the conservation. I think that the legacy is in the hearts and in the heads of the people. So I am quite sure that we are going, people are going to take care of the legacy. Any final takes on that, Euclidus? I believe the legacy will continue from continuing the work and the support we received from AVA. I would like to say that we're very grateful for MAVA. MAVA has united a community. It has united a country. It has united the West African region. And our responsibility is to work and make MAVA very proud. Thank you so much for your continued efforts at turtle conservation in West Africa. Thank now, uh, let's just uh, zoom in and uh, take a, a deep look into one of these islands in West Africa.
depuis agora e tem muita relação que o meio onde que está vive então aqui base não vai buscar aquele aspecto Exato. tradicionais positivo e não juntar com aspecto técnico científico para poder fazer que trabalho na Polônia And we now zoom out from West Africa and zoom into the Mediterranean to talk about cultural landscapes, one of the region's best kept secrets. If you're having a hard time picturing a cultural landscape, here's one example, farming terraces, like the one you're about to see on screen right now from Turkey. These sites are not only important because of their historic heritage or autochthonous farming method, but also because these human activities are actually great for the environment. Now, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is our group from the Mediterranean. Now, Paula, let's start with you. Since you, are, since you work directly with MAVA, let's start by explaining our viewers how these cultural landscapes enhance the biodiversity and environment. Yes, maybe I can start with the example that you showed on, on terraces and explain how these terraces help the environment. For example, the, the dry stone walls are habitat for a series of uh, bats, of reptiles, of birds. The, the trees, the fruit trees that are planted on the terraces are really important because uh, insect pollinators use them as food. And in terms of um, water infiltration, for example, or um, soil erosion, the terraces are also playing a great role. And this is this win-win situation, this uh, uh, dual benefits for the environment and for the community, their culture, their economy, that led us to work on the aspect of cultural landscape. And this started in 2011 already. And at that time, we convened two groups of partners. Those people working on nature, who had an interest in culture, and those people working on culture who had an interest on nature. And we tried to, to help them find a common way towards a new method that would benefit both nature and both culture and in the framework of cultural landscapes. And this led to the creation of an alliance called the Alliance of Mediterranean um, Nature and Culture. And this alliance is made out of 15 organizations now working in eight countries in the Mediterranean. And they are working on three different landscapes, the high mountains, for example, in Morocco, in the High Atlas, the mosaics that you find in islands, such as, uh, for example, Minorca in the Balearics, and those wooded uh, landscape savannas that you have, for example, in Spain, in the Dehesas. All right. Now, uh, for Luke Hoffman, this idea of promoting the harmony between culture and nature developed after conversations with his good friend, Timios Papayanis. Yeah. Now, Timios uh, eventually became a, a big advocate of the ecological movement in Greece, and Luke revolutionized the cultural landscape idea throughout the Mediterranean. Timios eventually founded Medina, one of MAVA's first partners when it came to cultural landscapes. And that's when you, Alexis, uh, came in. You represent Medina, and uh, you told me that MAVA's support was crucial to organizations similar to yours. So why so and how were you able to use that funding? Yes, uh, 20 years ago, um, this concept that uh, Paul was describing, this uh, concept of nature uh, conservation combined with uh, the promotion of cultural heritage was very new. Uh, therefore, organizations like ours, uh, Medina, uh, needed a support in order to bring forward their mission. And uh, the MAVA Foundation did not only help us, uh, promo uh, support us to promote uh, activities on the ground, but also was promoting the whole uh, idea. Uh, so for us, I think in three ways, it was very crucial to receive this support. The first one is that with, that with this support, we were able to bring forward activities on the ground. And this is very important. The second one is that we were able to build wider alliances uh, that helped us advocate, share knowledge among each other, and uh, spread the message. 
And the third one, and equally important, I would say, is that we receive a support to strengthen the internal capacities of the organization. We were able to develop human capacities and leadership. And this, I think, was in benefit not only for Medina as an organization, but the wider community and the whole country. And Sana, you also mentioned that uh, Luke became one of the pioneers when it came to the cultural landscape concept. So can we make a, a brief comparison to how we see that concept now, thanks to Luke, to or versus 20 years ago? Yeah. Thanks, Ariane, for this question. So 20 years ago, uh, UNESCO recognized the cultural practices and defined them, among other aspects, as the interaction between human activities and nature. But at that time, there were no link highlighted between the biodiversity and the cultural practices. Then a group of six NGOs started to work in the Mediterranean, supported by MAVA Foundation. So we first identified those practices in the Mediterranean, demonstrated the link between biodiversity and those cultural practices by scientific proof, to, to then conserve them and promote them. Today, MAVA has the cultural practices and the cultural landscape in its strategy. And we have more and more interest from other partners, such big organizations, such as AUCN, also big donors, such, like uh, CEPF, Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. So for us, it's a real, real big change and a big achievement. And how were networking opportunities uh, facilitated by MAVA, and how did the organizations in the Mediterranean seize that opportunity? Yeah, so networking is very important when it comes to a subject that is very new, like the cultural landscape. And uh, yeah, so for us, first, that's why MAVA first founded the Mediterranean Consortium for Nature and Culture, which was a group of six NGOs. And then when MAVA integrated uh, the cultural landscape in its strategy, this allowed us to become bigger and to become the Mediterranean Alliance for Nature and Culture and to have the double of its number. And then when it comes to networking opportunities, we had a lot of them thanks to MAVA. So we, we first had this uh, uh, Leadership Nature Academy, which connected all the geographical area with all the thematic. We also had uh, the chance to participate to many conferences, international conferences like the UN Climate Change Conferences, the, UN, uh, the IUCN Congress Conferences. And also, thanks to the projects, we've been able to visit all the pilot sites. So all the projects, so we've been in contact with the local communities, exchanged expertise and knowledge. And even when MAVA is, winding, is now closing, we had the chance to organize, uh, to, to attend event uh, like uh, the MAVA Donors Fair in Tunisia. And we've been in contact with the new donors, with the new pot potential donors, and also the Cultural Landscape Conference in Lisbon. So we had a lot of uh, events and conferences. And, yeah. So talking about events, conferences all over the world regarding cultural landscapes, um, what about policy making? I know that, well, the word culture or the words cultural landscapes uh, became a part of the vocabulary when it came to policies in each of the countries here in the Mediterranean, but also in the European Union. Paul, can, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes, of course. Thank you. It is a very interesting question, very important question, that of policy. We know that only having a policy doesn't make any difference. But if we don't have the policy, then we can't build any further. So they are critical. You, you spoke about the European Union first. Let's start there. I'm sure you heard about one policy of the European Union that has been very damaging for the environment, and it's the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. And what our partners managed to do, of course, as part of a greater coalition of partners, it's always like that when you want to influence policy, but they managed to have, for the first time, in, it's historical in, in the EU, to have massive amount of money dedicated to more sustainable agriculture and naming very clearly the cultural landscapes. To make this concrete, in Spain and Portugal, there will be annually, starting this year, two billion dedicated to having more sustainable practices in agriculture, including those in cultural landscapes. So a great victory. But there's not only the EU. If you know, in the Mediterranean, out of 27 countries, you have only six that are in the EU. So it's very important as well to try to change policy at country level, national level. 
and there will be many examples to give you, but considering time, I'm going to speak only about Lebanon. Very recently, the law for uh, natural protection and protected areas in Lebanon was, um, was declared a new law, and this law includes specially protected areas protected by local community and through cultural landscape practices. So this has been recognized, and now we have 26 of these so-called HEMA in Lebanon that have been declared as protected areas. So this is a great victory because it's not a protected, classical protected area declared by the states. No, it's local people deciding that they could make a difference for the environment and through practicing their traditional cultural um, practices, <laughs> they could really make a difference for the environment and for the, the cultural landscapes. And the last element I'd like to, to highlight, because I think it's very important, it's that this group of people working for the Alliance, uh, in the Alliance that we mentioned before, so they've been working at also making changes at international level beyond the Mediterranean. For example, the declaration of 2026 as the year for um, uh, rangelands and pastoralists has been one of the success of, of this group. And it's really important because it's not only about communication, it's talking more about these subjects. It is also making more changes of policies that I've seen, we have seen are extremely important to make a difference. So many legacies here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've mentioned quite a few in the, <laughs> in, in the land of policymaking, networking, uh, connectivity, organizational development, a lot, a lot that Mava is leaving behind. Thank you so much for your enlightening take regarding to cultural landscapes. Now, before we switch gears uh, to our next topic, we wanted to give you a better sense of how diverse this community was, which is why we hope you enjoy the following video.
And even though these moments were part of the past, the idea is that this sense of community remains and that the spirit of Mava stays alive. Now, something that André Hoffman realized soon enough after he stepped in is that we cannot talk about nature without talking economics, and we cannot talk economics without building allies. This is how Mava soon became one of the driving forces in the sustainable economy movement we see today. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Oliver, let's start with uh, you. You were definitely one of MAVA's biggest and strongest uh, allies concerning the green economy. Briefly tell us how you became involved. Okay, so firstly, it's a privilege to be here because MAVA is a pioneer and we should celebrate the work they did. You say that it's unusual or it's normal to think of economy and nature together. It isn't. Ten years ago, we were, a few people were in the conservation movement were struggling with the scale of the challenges. They're so big, climate change, biodiversity loss, environmental breakdown. What is big enough as a commensurate response to that massive challenge and whisper it slowly, carefully, sustainable economy. But who was brave enough to step into that space? Well, Marva were, the Green Economy Coalition were, and a handful of others. And here we are a decade later and we've created a global program, a global organization, and we've helped the movement. So it's extraordinarily brave, pioneering, but we did it together. Now, Holger, um, you've been with MAVA for 17 years, which means that you are the longest serving employee of MAVA. You know MAVA under Luke and MAVA under André, which means, again, that you had to switch gears fast enough uh, to have a more economic approach. Oliver here was telling me that you were spot on with uh, each investment you made. Can you tell us a bit about them? Well, first of all, thank you very much to remind me that my colleagues uh, call me the Mava dinosaur. <laughs> but <laughs> more to your question. Uh, yeah, there was this time when Andre took over and we wanted to do more of economics. And we had the the room and the time to actually go out and learn about it, experiment. What does that mean, investing in economic change? And it took us maybe two to three years to really hone down on what I would say three issues that really matter. That the first is getting nature into economic thinking and planning. And out of that came that whole work on natural capital-based green economies that Oliver was greatly involved in. The second thing was that finance really matters. And you need to find ways of how to actually create revenue streams from and for intact nature. And that's a whole work that led into financing for nature. And the third point is we needed to deal with the resources use. And circular economy was the idea out there at the time. And I think it gives us a very good manual how to actually reduce or design out waste and wastefulness. So the three things we did. All right. Any, any thoughts, uh, Oliver, on how MAVA became a key piece of the puzzle on the sustainable economy movement we see today? Well, look, I mean, a decade ago, it was a, it, it was a concept, an idea, a sustainable economy, a small idea only held by a few people. And if you scan forward now, we've just had the Americans produce their what's called Inflation Reduction Act, their big green economy idea. We've got the, uh, the European Union with their, their Green Deal. We've got the Chinese with their eco-civilization. So the big economic blocks have got policies, and there's about five trillion of public money in play. And usually that catalyzes at least three times that amount of private money. So this idea is off and running, and it has gone from concept to reality in just over a decade. And we are seeing the emergence of a sustainable economy. We've still got distance to go, but we have made... We've, we've managed to carry this, this idea for over the valley of death from concept to reality. And that's partly the legacy of MAVA. Okay, but because MAVA was also part of many policymaking initiatives, right? It was uh, behind uh, the, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, the Inflation Reduction Act, correct? Well, uh, we all contributed to creating that policy framework. So I think that what's important is that the idea was no longer a, a, a sort of um, extreme idea. It, was, it became a more mainstream idea. 
And lots of people have had a contribution, but really what's brave is to step in when something's a concept and it seems so, you know, change the whole economy within a generation. Who's going to back that? Somebody really brave and somebody <laughs> who's playing for the long game, who's really committed to the agenda. So that's the legacy of Marva, stepping in at that brave moment when a few, few people thought that we were um, perhaps a little strange to tackle such a big challenge. So, Olga, um, if MAVA hadn't existed then, how would the green economy narrative be different today? That, that's a difficult question to answer, but it was already alluded to in different interventions before. And I would summarize it like bet and back. So betting on the new, interesting, promising ideas out there and backing them, backing the people, individuals sometimes, two people just forming a new organization and just giving them the space and the capacity to think it through and develop the idea. And I think that has made a difference. And when we look now out there, the big organization shaping the agenda on these different uh, three issues, I would say there are quite a few out there that MAVA supported at very early stage. And I think it might look very different or different without. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Olger and Oliver. It was so great to see how the Huffman family's visions and funds were really the seed that planted many of the sustainable movements we see today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, MAVA was not only supported, MAVA not only supported innovation for a greener economy, but was also supporting the emergence of conservation finance meaning a new sustainable funding mechanism for biodiversity conservation. Let's hear from Aisha Sidi Bona, former president of the board of the Bacomab, Bank Argan and Coastal Marine Biodiversity Trust Fund, the first conservation trust fund of its kind in West Africa. From the first years of operations of the Trust Fund, MAVA has always, always supported us in every step of its evolution. This type of innovative mechanism is very hard to set up from scratch, and MAVA has always been there to support, guide us, and overcome these difficulties. Today I would like to thank the Hoffman family, represented by André Hoffman, as well as Linda Manson, the director of the MAVA Foundation. Thanks to them, because they have always assisted BACOMAB in terms of um, human resources, as well as logistically and financially. We have become what we are today, a foundation funding conservation through all the activities in the Bandargan and Diaoling parks, funding con preservation of ecosystems and learning in terms of all the environmental education of children. Of course, MAVA couldn't ignore what was happening in its own backyard. Last year, the Swiss Confederation reported that one third of all species and half of habitats in Switzerland are threatened. Among many efforts, MAVA has taken specific actions to protect rivers, promote sustainable agriculture, and create awareness in the Swiss canton of Vaux, which is where MAVA's headquarters had been located. To facilitate the conversation with our next guests, I'll be switching to French. Bonjour. Hi, everyone. Alors, uh, Jérôme, uh, Jérôme toi. we can start with um, you. To reinforce nature conservation in the Swiss canton of Vaux, you guided the Nature Vaudoise platform. The Swiss biodiversity strategy was set up in 2012. So could you briefly explain how the platform contributes to the strategy? The platform contrib contributes first by uniting all the actors of nature conservation in the region. So once again, it's one of the coalitions we mentioned. This group of actors align strategically with the Swiss biodiversity strategy. So all these actors align their action on waterway revitalization, on environmental 
revitalization with the support of the foundation. And what was the impact ever since the platform was launched? On the ground, I would say that first the idea is to revitalize the rivers, as you said, about 10 kilometers were revitalized. We also set up water environments, about 100 of them, and there were many other projects, like creating groves, so many actions on the ground. But I would say that the main impact is creating this coalition, and so people have been working together for six, seven years. Okay, so you can now see on your screen a picture of the platform members. And François, <laughs> whom you can see on the screen, is a member. François, welcome. How did MAVA funding help? How did MAVA funding help obtaining more Swiss um, federal money? There was a large impact because we have uh, we have we are lucky enough to have uh, large funding resources. But first, the local authorities or the owner of the territory needs to contribute 10 to 30 percent of the funding. So in mountainous regions, we don't have a lot of funding resources, and so measures were not taken on the ground. And thanks to MAVA, we could substitute ourselves. Uh, in other words, offer the funding to the local authorities and they could have access to forest, uh, forest biodiversity, revitalization of water courses, etc. Sophie, we know that uh, a large part of the Swiss economy depends on tourism. On your website, you say that forest preservation allows to reinforce biodiversity and also attracts more and more tourism. So how do you combine biodiversity conservation and tourism, tourism without any issues? Of course, that's one of the big challenges we have in Switzerland because we, have, we are a small country with a lot of activities and people are also used to going um, into nature in terms of leisure activities. So the idea is to try and tackle this question and strike a balance between um, ecosystem preservation and um, leisure activities. So there are three things we can do to strike this balance. First, monitoring to see how many people come, how often, for which activity. Then we have to guide these people in the environment to, so that they know which behavior they should have, for example, in the forest and then planning um, infrastructure. We know that people go to certain regions more often when there is a path which is signal this kind of thing. Jérôme, the story of your first contact, contact with MAVA is a good story. It's a good example of the spirit of the foundation. So tell us about this letter you sent to Luc and about his astonishing answer. Uh, it's an old story. I was a young biologist. I was 23 years old. I was looking for funding to fund my doctoral research in uh, nature conservation, so I contacted a series of funders. I sent a letter to the MAVA Foundation, which was about as young as I was. And I remember clearly that I did that on a Monday. I sent all the letters on a Monday, and I thought I would wait for a month. And on the Thursday, I received a letter from MAVA. MAVA accepted to fund my research. And um, consequently, I could uh, tell all the other funders that I had this first support from MAVA. And this uh, reputation of MAVA was there, I think, already or Luke's reputation, and all the funding started from that. So it was the beginning of my the beginning of my career, and what was impressive was that during all my work, Luke was regularly asking about uh, progress. And I always found that astonishing because I knew there were a lot of projects going on and he was more or less alone. Very interesting. Thank you. François, of course, we know that no one can protect the environment without first loving it 
and understanding it. So tell us a bit about the way the Nature Vaudoise platform sensitizes people and um, the other actors on, in the region. So we agree on that. So we have uh, to work on people's willingness, on authorities' willingness to act for nature. So we have different areas uh, to take action. So we can work on local development, environment protection with people who have technical capacities, who are motivated, who are in contact with the authorities and the communities. We can sensitize to the environment, so education to the environment, and it's very important to have motivated people. We have also projects, of course, so the different actors of the platform work on the ground, so we have to learn by doing. And also, we have training, training programs, for example, for logging, for local authorities, on the way you can maintain um, the natural environment. So it's like the different fingers on your hands. And MAVA then brings us um, the confidence we need and the network which we need to support these four areas of intervention. Thank you very much for this explanation. Last question, Sophie. Very briefly, today we are experiencing the final chapter of MAVA. What is the impact of disclosure on your platform? So, as it was uh, mentioned, I think the platform was created to reinforce collaboration between the different actors in uh, nature protection in our region. This objective um, was set because of our needs. The needs are still there, so we are going to continue working together, collaborating. Uh, between the different institutions. We already have um, a program of different, um, with different meetings. So we are confident we are going to continue our work with this platform. Thank you, Sophie, François and Jérôme for your inputs, which uh, perfectly illustrates the power of collaboration. We could keep days talking about the endless experiences that brought positive change to so many endangered lands and species. This show was just a small glimpse of what MAVA has accomplished. After all, there were 500 partner organizations involved. To read more about them, I invite you again to search MAVA's website right now and find its new commemorative book, MAVA Foundation for People and Nature. Fully accessible for free. As a token of gratitude, all of our partners will be receiving two hard copies. Now, before we leave, I've invited André for five additional minutes to share some last words and reflections on MAVA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me here. Now, before we end, I really want to know any takeaways that come with any of these reflections. Well, so much. They're, they're difficult to put in order. I mean, this is an overwhelming show of uh, of consideration of things working together. You know, I, I would say that in the long term, if we do want to change the system and change the system, we must, uh, this approach of uh, humility linked with the capacity to listen and to react, this combination of being persevering without being stubborn, persevering while being flexible, these are lessons that we can use for a lot of other things. I think humility is one of the most um, understated uh, quality of, uh, of MAVA. We've been around the place and we've done a lot of good things because we listened and because we ensured that people in our network uh, were able to express the things they do best by knowing what is happening. Traditional philanthropy is based on people knowing better than the others and imposing their vision. We didn't do that and that's, I think, a great quality. Now, anything you would have done differently? Yes, I would, I would probably, um, broadly, the answer is no, of course. But, um, of course, you, would like, you always want to accelerate the things you've done well, and you always want to sort of forget the ones we missed. But uh, as, as a president, I can really say that over the 12 years where I was president, uh, there was no major uh, failure. We actually identified the needs of the cause and served them reasonably well. I don't want to sound conceited or arrogant, but um, I, I think that uh, our time... In the, in the region was the proper time. We, we, we actually were able to do 
a lot of work which was needed. And we've just heard it from Sophie, you know, there's a need there, so let's continue to satisfy. In the past, uh, you've talked about the negative impacts of short-term profit maximization. And that means the idea of making the most profit in the shortest amount of time. What would be your message to the world regarding this? Well, <clears throat> um, I think the, the question contains the answer already. We, we, we actually need to think long term. If we only focus on the immediate satisfaction of what it is we're trying to do, um, we are just going to, uh, swap, we're going to swap the success of the long term against the short term. The idea that our whole economic system is based on the principle of homo economicus, who is this wonderful agent who always has perfect knowledge of everything that happens and which al who always sorry, uh, decides in his best possible interest in the immediate future, that idea is a myth. It's a fallacy. It does not exist. We are a different type of institution. We are, we are humans. We are talking to each other. We have feelings. We do things for free because we enjoy doing them. And it's not just a question about remuneration. So yes, short-term profit maximization has destroyed the planet, and we need some systems to compensate for that. To end this amazing show, everyone keeps wondering, what is the next chapter of your personal story? Well, I was hoping you would ask the question. In fact, I knew you would. So I'm <laughs> going to give you, I'm going to give you three things I think are important. Um, first, we have to understand the impact we're having on the system. Secondly, we have to, to understand how we can continue to create the sustainable prosperity we all aspire to. And thirdly, we need to identify leadership. We need to make sure that we have lead, leaders in front of us. So I, I will just elaborate on the three points. The, f the first one, um, you know, impact. Every decision a human makes on the planet, for whatever reason it be, it be it, for commercial or for any other reason, has an impact on three big capitals, the social capital, human capital and the natural capital. Nature is what we come from at MABA, but I think that the future is much more about the interface between nature and humanity. And so we really do need to understand what impact we're having on the, on the planet on, uh, in, in terms of social system, you know, why are we all uh, here as a group? In terms of human capital, can we be happy? And of course, in terms of nature. Now, the, the second thing we, the, the second uh, point I was just making was the point about moving away from uh, regeneration, sorry, got it wrong, uh, going away from pollution and extraction to regeneration. And that's a completely different way of thinking about the natural resource. It's writing a new uh, uh, contract to the planet. How can we use it for the long term? And thirdly, we do need leaders to put all this in place. We need leaders who are going to be bold, have a vision, but are also courageous because courage is a really Again, one of these understated quality. When um, Oliver just told us that we were courageous at the time when you entered into an economic thinking, I think that is what, what we need, sort of courageous thinking. Now, one last thing I have to say about this, in fact, not the last one, the penultimate one, uh, is, is that, of course, um, uh, philanthropy is not the way to deal with these issues in particular. Um, this is public goods. These are public wealth. These are public, it belongs to all of us. So we should be able to create system which will support this creation of value in a sustainable manner, which means there has to be a financial sustainability as well. So the idea of funding projects by just a fond perdu is not really a guarantee of success. I think we need systems to be self-support if we want them to be there for the long term. Thank you, André. For... Can I just say one last thing? Yeah. <laughs> I, the last time I'm in front of this, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I mean, the, 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 we just talked about the 500 part, we talked about the thousands of people who worked. It would not have been possible without you. And before, answering, before turning off the light and drinking a glass of champagne to your good health, I just want to tell you that, you know, we love you. You've done it properly. You've done it the way we should do it. When I talk about love, I don't talk about the Hollywood love. I talk about, you know, philanthropos, about the love of the human. And we've, exp we've expressed that so clearly with this foundation. This is a wonderful success story. It changed my life, and I hope that, um, uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, André, for this emotional speech. Um, it has been a genuine pleasure serving as the host of this event. It truly has. And uh, thank you all of you for joining us in celebrating this, in fact, impactful foundation. Thank you, really, for joining us. Let me now invite the MAVA team and board to join us on stage to, on stage to cheer for this life-changing experience as the very last goodbye.
Yeah. Can you do it in camera? <laughs> <laughs> now, are we, what are we talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah.